Well, the anti-slavery movement and the effort to get to abolition um, was all wrapped up in all sorts of other causes as well. So intemperance was huge. Um, there is continued agitation around the rights of women and whether or not they can have access to education. There's um, ongoing debate about um, representation because of taxation. So you have African Americans really working um, towards petition drives and um, other kinds of legislative action that will that will reflect their presence um, in the United States. You have um, increased formalization of the Underground Railroad movements, and you have self-emancipated people making their way into the northern cities. And you also have slavery and the, um, the interstate traffic in slavery intensifying and becoming much more streamlined. Um, so in the 1820s, we are, you know, in a way between wars. Um, you have the War of 1812, and then you have the Mexican War looming for the 1840s. We know that the Civil War is in the 1860s, but it's this moment, I think, where um, there is much to be done around social causes of all kinds. And, um, you know, as uh, I think one of Garrison's colleagues said, you know, when he finally became an abolitionist um, par excellence, she said, he didn't hate intemperance um, or poverty less. He hated slavery more. And so those were the kinds of ch choices um, that were available to somebody who was thinking about a life uh, dedicated to making the world and this country a better place. Well, certainly this is a time there's a great awakening, right? The second great awakening, and you have, um, um, although, you know, I think that, I think that churches were in increasingly becoming social organizations that were then taking on political um, objectives and agendas. But you have a lot of attention being paid to this notion of salvation, of uh, conscientious Christianity and performance of good works. But as that conversation is happening, you're also seeing an increased institutionalization of church practice. And with institutions come rules, with rules come exclusions and penalties and benefits. And so there are all sorts of negotiations being made in the same breath as people are talking about what it means to be a sinner and what it means to be saved and how does one convert others. Um, and so you see a lot of conversation about um, sort of moral sensibilities. And that will come to play a huge role in the abolitionist struggle, and certainly for William Lloyd Garrison, who was really somebody uh, advancing this notion that one's morality was one's compass, and that moral suasion, that emphasis on persuading individuals to hear their own conscience and to act in a way that was moral, and not just delusionally moral, but really upstanding and right. and. Um, uh, you see all of that coming into play in the 1820s, more broadly speaking. Um, but you have much more of a performance of Christianity, um, and you have a move towards increased institutionalization of religious practice. Well, Garrison inherits um, Garrison inherits a, a sense of the power of faith and the transcendence that can come when one believes in a promised land, in a creator in a world beyond this one. Um, we know he's born into poverty. His father abandons the family, but only after really displaying his distress and his depression and his tendency toward drink and really performing his sense of being less than in a world that was just you know, shifting in ways that he couldn't predict and couldn't take advantage of. But Garrison's mother, who's often referred to as Sister Garrison, um, was a devout Baptist, and she truly hoped that Garrison, her son, would um, would take on, uh, and that he would become. A, I think she she imagined that he would become a fully orbed Baptist at some point, and she did worry that all the work he was doing as a writer would take him away from God and take him away from goodliness. And he would tell her, no, it's the writing that keeps me good. You know, you want me to write because that's what makes me um, stay away from vice and trouble. Um, so he begins in that world of, um, of Baptist organization. His mother is also the first, I think, to organize a, um, a women's evangelical group in the United States. So he is aware of the work that can be done within the church and the kind of support that can come 
from a church community because when his family's in distress, it's his mother's brethren um, and the church community that rally around her to help and su to support him. But he moves away, as we know, from that sense that organized religion is, in tr is truly organized um, for the best purposes of humanity. And he begins to move, I think, even before um, he meets Helen Benson and the Benson family, who um, themselves have strong Baptist ties but are moving away to more um, um, more of a sense of an uh, inner light and that one must listen to oneself and one's heart and be guided by one's conscience and one must try to be good. I mean, it was just a very simple, straightforward code. You know, listen to your heart and don't do anything wrong. And you'll know it's wrong uh, because your heart will either harden or it will be in an uproar. So Garrison is a, a place where he moves away from that Baptist organization, in part because he's seeing the ways in which you know, the conversation about slavery is all wrapped up in excuses. One of the primary apologies, you know, primary justifications is that, well, we go to the coast of Africa and we raid these villages only because we want to bring them to the Lord. And, you know, there are those who would say, well, you could just take the Lord there. But, um, you know, Garrison sees the way in which religious hypocrisy is playing into a political economic and social system that is now um, just unjust and inhuman. And so is moving away from those particular kinds of tenets and towards what is much more of a transcendent kind of spirituality. Thinking about the Bible as an anti-slavery or even a pro-slavery text, again, just depends on who's reading it and um, who it is that they're reading it for and why they're reading it. So that you have the famous, you know, servants obey your masters that's intoned up and down, you know, throughout the southern states and even repeated in the north um, as a way to understand that there is a social order and yes, maybe the good Lord did intend for there to be this kind of separation and this kind of labor and a hereafter for those who are less fortunate. Um, but. You know, the Bible is also full of stories of bondage and slavery and, um, and people who are oppressed and unable to worship freely and have no access to education. So it just depends on where it is that you want to place yourself. Um, Garrison sits squarely in the middle of the Bible as a prophet, right? That, you know, and, and we meet other prophets in the Bible, people who are going to, to assess the world in which they are living and say, we need to move to a different place. We need, we need to pursue a different set of, of, um, of principles and objectives and goals and discipline. Um, so, so for Garrison, you know, the Bible was, as, was just as much his as it was the text that guaranteed a pro-slavery perspective. Because for him, you could bring your conscience to bear on the Bible. And his, he was truly, I think, a New Testament um, believer. He was uh, never in favor of warfare, never, he was a pacifist, um, did not believe in violence, never, you know, raised a gun in protest. Um, but he didn't, con he didn't uh, judge those who did in ways that were unfair. He said, I understand. And, um, but, for, but for Garrison, the love of the New Testament, the ability to forgive, the ability to come to a place where you meet your conscience and are converted. Conversion was so key for him. Um, but the Old Testament's full of the battles and the intonations and the tablets and the commandments. And, you know, there are times in his life as an, as a, um, leader of the abolitionist movement where he is involved in, you know, crafting declarations of intent and constitutions. So he's not, he doesn't find um, documents and um, uh, guidelines like that to be, um, you know, anathema. He's, he decides, well, there's a practical use for them, but, you know, again, in moderation, only so far as you can then do the work that you are called to do. Not that those will define the work that you cannot do. He ended up in jail in Baltimore because he spoke his mind. Um, Garrison was a man who would, in our um, way of saying today, you know, called it as he saw it. And he was in Baltimore and he was seeing the traffic uh, in slavery. But Baltimore is a curious place because it has a substantial African-American free population. And it also is the hub for interstate 
slavery traffic. So you have an enormous um, shipbuilding and um, uh, sort of docks and harbors and um, ships coming in bearing all sorts of products of that um, triangle trade and thinking about um, just the ways in which Baltimore was key to the maintenance of slavery. So he uh, he sees all this industry, uh, and he sees the profit, and he sees the heartlessness of these merchants, because that's what they were and all the richness of that term. Um, and he decides to name one of the sea captains and and decide that, you know, yes, I will charge you with this crime of actually, you know, contributing to this institution of slavery and not doing, uh, not being an upstanding citizen and doing all that's wrong. And, um, and that's slander. Garrison's distrust of the system um, grew, intensified, because of the ways in which he saw uh, the political, social, economic machinery increasingly working together to protect the interests and assets and financial um, benefits and profits that were just so tied up, intertwined in slavery. Slavery was no social practice. It wasn't a religious practice. It was entirely economic. Um, this was a nation built on work. And there were people who were working. They were not being paid. They had no rights. They had, you know, and he saw that. And so for, for Garrison to suggest that a man who was doing, uh, that a sea captain was, was doing business that was in fact unconscionable, there's the slander. It's not that he's making a living for himself, it's the business in which he's making a living that's against God, against country, and should be against his own conscience. And so for that, that's the charge, that Garrison is not just critiquing the practice of making a dollar or two or 300 or 5,000, He's critiquing the heartlessness that goes into protecting and creating more profit off the bodies of enslaved people. So Garrison makes his way to Boston um, to, well, you know, it's funny, um, because there are these moments in Garrison's life where he, um, there are these moments when his life's work, at these moments when he makes huge transitions, as he does when he moves from Baltimore to Boston and he's trying to begin the liberator and formalize his position as a, uh, an abolitionist and a, a man in the public sphere, he takes a holy pledge. I mean, this is a man who believes in promises. You know, and I think that that's at the heart of who Garrison really is. And part of his conviction as an abolitionist is, and part of his unswerving rejection of the Constitution, for instance, that that was a promise broken. Uh, that document represented promises that were not kept. And he is such a sentimentalist. He's such a romantic. This man is just, uh, you know, as he says to Helen on one occasion, I'm quite the combination, am I not? You know, I'm quite the, uh, the mix of things. Out there in the world, I'm like a lion. And with you, I'm just a little kitten. I mean, he says these things. This is the man who, you know, is taking on governments and, and um, you know, sort of escaping lynch mobs. And, you know, but he's, he's such, um, in that way, I think it's the romantic activism in him. So he takes, so, you know, he's met with Benjamin Lundy and has, you know, gone to work on the genius of universal emancipation. And then he comes back and at these moments, both where he's going to work with Lundy and again when he's about to take up the liberator, he makes these pledges that are very solemn. They're like marriage vows where he says, you know, I pledge to do this work with all that I have and I will not stop. I pledge my life to it. I mean, that kind of heartfelt commitment, spoken aloud and offered in print, leaves a record. And it's something that he holds himself accountable to. And that then others will see from the absolute beginning that this is no charlatan. This is no man trying to take advantage of a political situation and say, oh, let's try the abolitionist cause. Maybe we can make a little dollar doing that. He is somebody who comes into the practice of abolition, anti-slavery, immediate abolition, with a sense that it is indeed a conviction, that it is a marriage of ideas, that it is something, it's a cause to die for, but it's also a cause by which he will live, you know? You know, one of the things that made Benjamin Lundy so awe-inspiring for, well, no, one of the things that made him so impressive for Garrison was the fact that 
he himself was moved to activism by what he saw and what he felt. And Lundy had been working in Wheeling, Virginia, which is now West Virginia, and had seen coffles of enslaved people being moved through markets. And he said, you know, I saw that and I felt their pain and, I, and the iron came into my soul. Um, and for Garrison, Again, it's all about proximity, that it's genuine activism, because it's rooted in access to conversations with exchanges with counsel from, mentoring by the very people in whose name and on whose behalf he is also going forward. So he has his very practical agendas of what he wants for the nation, but it's also informed by his ability to listen and to seek out those on, you know, for whom he's working. And Lundy, I think it was, uh, complained. You know, he says, the colored people are everywhere, but they're the last people anybody ever thinks of going to talk to or get advice from. Um, and so Garrison is able to make a difference because he basically has that connection on the ground. His activism is rooted in the day-to-day -day reality. So when he is in Baltimore, and becomes part of that African-American community and is not only depending on them for sanctuary I and mean, he's boarding or for support or you know thinking aloud. I mean, this is a man who loves to talk and who loves to write. And he's not going to exist in their company as a silent, solitary soul. He's gathering information and he's um, sharpening his perspectives. And you see him ensconced in various um, African-American communities up and down the Atlantic seaboard. So in Providence, in Boston, he is, you know, welcomed like the, you know, the, the, the favorite son, come home. And it's genuine and it's not patronizing. It is, an, it, it's a thoroughly respectful um, welcome to a man who, again, has made this solemn vow that's not to defend them, but to make the country live up to the ideals in such a way that they too can live here and he can live here in a way that is, is good and uplifting. Certainly his proximity, I think, to African-American communities and families and individuals and men and women and even the children um, changes how his politics um, Evolve, you know, just changes his politics. Um, he starts out with vague notions and, you know, endorsements of colonization, and then he moves on to gradual abolition, and then he moves on to immediate abolition. And that's the, you know, third time's the charm, right? He gets at that point that um, after seeing what he's seen, families rooted in this country with members, you know, ancestors who have fought in the wars to claim this nation of individuals who are forming schools and militias and organizing themselves as entrepreneurs and industry. I mean, there is no field in which an African-American family community um, is, is, is not represented technically. It's this, a, 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 an active, vibrant, um, and earnest set of, of object, you know, of, of individuals and communities. So, so one of the things that's important to recognize. It's not just that Garrison has this informal uh, relationship with African-American communities and institutions as well, but that it is very much deliberate and that he uses his um, time in African-American communities, in churches, in meetings, to think very deliberately about how to organize his own abolitionist campaign. When he comes to Boston, you know, before he's established the New England Anti-Slavery Society, which he does in the only church that will open its doors to him, which is the African Baptist Church on, um, uh, on Beacon Hill, um, you know, before he gets to that point on that snowy night in December of 1832, he, um, he, is preceded by the Massachusetts General Colored Association, which is a group of men who have great ties to the Prince Hall Masonic Lodge, which is the first African-American lodge in the world, and also the first Masonic order in the nation. Um, and he sees the ways in which they themselves are organizing through, again, their petition drives, their solidarity meetings, and their efforts to institutionalize equality, that they've been advocating for equal opportunity. But in the meantime, 
they've been taking care of community and documenting the ways in which they can uplift themselves both politically, socially, and intellectually. So when Garrison comes to Boston, he, he, he's in a way preaching to the already converted, but it's not even so much that as he is joining like-minded men. They are men of, and women of color, but they are all like-minded souls. And so there is a true connection and a partnership that can go forward. There's a kind of work that Garrison can do precisely because he is a white man in America in the 1830s that many of them could not do um, from you know 1638 to that point. Um, and it, when it becomes evident that the work of the New England Anti-Slavery Society is going forward and that that is a body that will make a difference, the men of the Mass General Colored Association join in, they become um, really a first cohort of African-American members. So it's clear that Garrison is both learning from, partnering with, being inspired by the people of color, both the free people of color that he's meeting in cities like Baltimore, Philadelphia, um, and Boston. But he's also then um, creating his own method of moving forward. The Nat Turner Revolt happens in 1831, and really the decade of the 1830s is just so fraught and full and tumultuous and transformative for Garrison. But with that revolt in Southampton, Garrison is unable to step away from the reality of violence. It also brings him to a place where he realizes that there are two ways into abolition. And depending on which side of the line of freedom in which you're standing, you know, violence may be, organized armed response may be the only effective way you have to gain your freedom and do the work of abolition. You know, later I think in the Civil War era, he says, you know, the work of the work of moral moral work is war work, he says. In eighteen thirty, he's beginning to see that moral work can be that work of revolt. He's an avowed pacifist, you know, tells everybody he's horror struck by the slaughter and the massacre, but he's also horror struck by the reprisals. So there are two sides to that Nat Turner story, the, um, the actions of Nat Turner and his followers, and then the reprisals against enslaved and free people of color and anybody else who might even give a hint of supporting abolitionism, anti-slavery, or even violence. Um, the Nat Turner revolt makes it clear that this is that anti-slavery work is no longer, although there have been revolts, slave revolts, since slavery began in the United States, but although there have been revolts and notable ones, such as the Nat Turner, the Nat Turner one with its calculation and with its effectiveness establishes like never before that there is a calculated and, um, and potential threat to the system of slavery like no one has ever seen or imagined before. That there could be more Nat Turners now wreaks just, it just plays havoc with this sense that you can have a union, that you can have the happy slave. I mean, Nat Turner just completely wipes away all those notions of myth and romance about the, um, you know, sort of the, the just the, the tranquility or the, you know, just the way in which slavery is benign and that there can be good masters and happy slaves and it's, it's really all fine. But now you have an African-American threat and you have that threat linked to the abolitionists because if they are anti-slavery, clearly Nat Turner is anti-slavery and those two things now become synonymous in a way. Garrison has to grapple with the reality of Nat Turner. He that is not something he can walk away from. And it's a story that dominates the liberator. But for Garrison, he says, I'm horror struck. It's not what I would have done, but I understand. And at that moment when he says, I understand, the Nat Turner revolt therefore has larger ramifications because he's not Say, he's not judging it and saying, cease and desist, we will move along in abolition with, with words, not weapons. He's saying, it may be weapons for some, 
I understand why. I choose words. But yes, you might see more weapons. That threat undoes the South. And so the reprisals are not just physical and not just intimidation in the South, but now because Nat Turner is a literate man and because he believes in God and has conveyed the sense that it was a divinely in, you know, inspired call to action, there are attempts to eliminate access to the Bible, to Sunday worship, there was no such, you know, knowledge now becomes a very dangerous thing for people of color. And, um, you know, you see efforts in the North for African Americans to really establish that knowledge is indeed not something new to them, but that it actually promotes a sense of citizenship and commitment to nation and to union and to uplifted um, lives and sensibilities. And that knowledge does not necessarily mean or translate into violent action against the state. Well, Helen Benson exudes a kind of calm and um, serenity and quiet confidence. You know, the pictures of her, the images that we have, suggest that she's feminine and genteel, but also very present. And it's fitting, I think, that they met or they caught sight of each other. She caught sight of him for the very first time in an African-American church. Uh, there was a meeting. Um, anti-slavery meeting and it's at that moment that she saw him and she was struck again not just by the words but the fact that he was there what he was doing what he was dedicating his life to she comes from a family that certainly had its Baptist leanings but was moving more towards that sensibility of follow your inner light and believe your inner truth and try to do as much good as you can in the world, and you don't need to judge yourself according to standards established by an institution. So, um, you know, at first he doesn't get her name right. He calls her Ellen in a letter that he says, you know, I did, I did see your, he's writing to her, her brother, and says, you know, I do hope at some point to make the acquaintance of Ellen once again. And she's thinking, ah, he has to know my name. But when she meets him in, in the early bits of their conversation, you can tell that she's not, you know, she's a woman who very much embodies the cult of true womanhood of the 19th century. She is pious in that sense that she believes in spirituality and, and a sense of being. Um, domesticity, even with all the um, physical challenges she would have, you know, from accidental falls to in illness and what we would now um, I think defined as chronic fatigue, you know, and scholars have, have diagnosed it as such based on um, her symptoms but you know she was somebody who in a moment would would arrive in the dining room with a tray filled with pastries and, and coffees and without blinking an eyelid so she was somebody for whom domesticity was not a chore but a means to supporting her husband's work and the work of their family and because you know in, in some ways um, you know she clearly had a power over him because um, you know, I'll never forget reading letters of Garrison, you know, sort of the courtship in their letters. And at one point he's writing to her and, and he says, um, I am no longer William Lloyd Garrison. I am now Helen Eliza Benson. Our souls are so intertwined that there is no way that I can find myself. And you read that and you think, how does this man who has come all the way through these tumultuous, earth-shattering historical moments and who has been jailed and survived a, a hard life and, you know, sort of uh, apprenticeships and worrying and the loss of his mother and the band of, how does a man like that who is now taking on the world disappear? And he says, I am no longer William Boy Garrison. I mean, you know, so the power that she has over him has everything, I think, to do with her heart and the absolute delight of love, because love makes the world a better place. And Garrison can go out beyond their home as he would and fight the battles that would just bring so many to their knees. But as his children said, there was never a time when he crossed the threshold, it was coming home, crossed the threshold, that he didn't have a smile on his face. He loved to come home. And Helen represents that kind of sanctuary, that kind of promise for him, almost from the very beginning. You know, he wonders aloud whether or not it was love at first sight. 
Um, but he says, you know, it is love. And this is the love of the ages. Um, and, uh, and it's really a remarkable love story because she's present and yet not. She's not competing with him for political attention. Yet she carries herself in a way that doesn't suggest that women have a lesser place. She is his partner in life. Her enterprises, her economy, make it possible for Mr. Garrison to sail to England or to, you know, take money uh, to to apply to the Liberator Press or to, you know, to support the efforts that he holds dear. And she, you never get that sense of competition between them. And it's this unspoken, gorgeous partnership. Um, and when the world is coming undone, you know, sort of as the civil war is raging and they're wondering about, you know, sort of what direction the country is going to go in, you know, at one point Helen writes to their daughter Fanny, and it's, and it's a delightful letter because she uses the plural. She says, we are worried about the state of our country. We are not convinced that Mr. Lincoln will indeed emancipate the slaves. And you have this voice of we, and that's Helen in a most sincere and genuine voice, representing this shared perspective. Um, and so it is a marriage that enables him to do the work of abolition. And it's a marriage that enables them to have a family that can survive the age of slavery. I think about the great postal campaign of 1835, and it's hard not to think of it as antebellum spam because it's truly a plan to bombard the mailboxes of, or post offices of all these southern states. And so you have, um, you know, you have the American Anti-Slavery Society thinking about how do we actually get our message out? What is it that we're doing as, a, as an organization? How are we going to bring attention to our cause? How are we going to convert people in the North uh, and convert them in terms of both the funds they'll use to support us, but also the societies that they themselves will create elsewhere? How do we get the message out? And in many ways, getting the message out meant that they would have to interact in some way or show that there was indeed a very, in, that there was an enormous gulf between a, a free North and a slave South. And so, you know, the written word in America has always been incredibly powerful and volatile. And thinking about the distribution of literature, like Walker's Appeal, sewed into the coats of sailors, making its way into the heart of the South. And, um, you know, in some ways, that kind of distribution can be very covert and effective. The Great Postal Campaign is very public and very obvious. So all these pamphlets are printed off and, you know, they're not meant to be um, aggressive as we might think about them. They're not intoning that all slaveholders are evil. They're instead saying, look at this mother who has been torn away from her child. Look at this poor child, you know, thinking about the, the consequences for individuals that slavery then imposes upon them, right? And um, so they fill sack after sack after sack with these pamphlets that are going to bombard Southern post offices. But they actually don't make it out to the homes of all these Southern slaveholders or pro-slavery people. In fact, they're intercepted at the post office. And so um, then, you know, in a way, all hell breaks loose because what to do with all this mail? They're not going to just discard it and say, oh, it doesn't matter because it does. This represents an assault upon Southern society. How dare you step over with all these messages and you now want us because of the post office to distribute this literature? So um, it's actually quite frightening. They build a bonfire. Um, or at least on several occasions, there are bonfires built, effigies. So Garrison is hung in effigy with other abolitionists, Tappan, who's of the American Anti-Slavery Society. They're burned in effigy over the, you know, sort of the, the fire coming up from the pamphlets. And, you know, there's a, there's a way in which abolitionists like Garrison are so wry, you know, that you, you, it's so hard to imagine how they could be so even-tempered, given the age in which they're living. Um, 
So there's all kinds of fallout from this. One is that the Southerners decide, you know, we're being attacked and you need to bring these scoundrels to justice. They must be kidnapped. They must be assassinated. I mean, it's incredible uproar and threats of violence that are, are really credible. I mean, at, at one point, you know, um, Arthur Tappan is being warned not to really move too freely around New York because assassins are waiting at every corner to stab him to death. And Garrison, of course, has threats against his own life. Um, but, you know, for them, they said, uh, oh, and, and then there's this marvelous moment where, you know, bounties are now being placed on their heads. And, of course, Georgia is, you know, at one point is very interested in getting Garrison and five, I think it's 500 or Five thousand, five thousand dollars to to um, bring Garrison dead or alive to to Georgia, but there's fifty thousand dollar bounty placed on Tappan's head, and he says, and you know, it's one of these moments was a fifty thousand dollar bounty placed on his head, and he says, well, if that sum is actually deposited in the bank, I might indeed surrender myself. So, you know, the the way in which they interact with the threat and um, and respond to this really clear and aggressive response is um, on the one hand brings just, you can see how they calm themselves down in the face of such threat. But, you know, at the end of that great postal campaign, which on the one hand did not work because the materials did not get distributed broadly, it did work because it showed Northerners who didn't know that there was such a divide. It showed them that even the hint of a pamphlet that did not indict anyone was enough to call people out with guns and pickaxes, with threats of violence and assassination. So with that high-pitched response, what is it that they are trying to defend? So actually, you see a, you know, a three-fold increase in anti-slavery societies being established right after 1835. You know, Garrison, Garrison's move into abolition was accompanied by all sorts of threats to his physical being. You know, so when he speaks his mind in Baltimore, he's jailed for seven weeks. But he takes time to write on the walls, composes sonnets, and then wants to go back and visit when he goes to Baltimore at the end of the Civil War. So there's that sense of that kind of incarceration or penalty or punishment being part of you know, this is the battle scars, the battle stripes this, um, of, of a life of activism. But when he is chased through the streets of Boston, um, when a lynch mob comes for him, when a scaffold is built in front of his family's home, that abolitionist struggle becomes increasingly personal. And yet, again, I think it goes back to the moment when he makes a holy vow to champion the cause of liberty and to advocate for immediate abolition and for a nation that comes back to its conscience and embraces a moral life that is worthy of admiration. That he, he emerges literally unscathed from those encounters with the mob in a way it's as though this is a man who's drawing out his enemy, right? Because when it's a mob of Boston gentlemen, gentlemen, you know, gentlemen, not the ruffians, not the drunken sailors, you know, on leave. You know, it's just gentlemen, a Boston mob. When he is um, afforded sanctuary by shopkeepers, when, you know, stalwart African-American men are guarding him and ferrying news to Helen, who's pregnant at one point when he's being chased um, and threatened with his life. It's as though he understands that this kind of attack is definitely personal, but it's also against the growing force of abolition. And that in a way it's not about him. You know, he, he sees that I mean, there are those who worry for his safety, and there is a group of stalwarts who walk him home every night from the Liberator um, because of the threat to his person. But he is not a man who worries about his physical safety because to do so would distract him from his intellectual agenda. Angelina Grimke's departure from her southern home was almost unheard of, you know, a, 
a rejection of that. It wasn't even so much a rejection as it was a, a decision to separate from a system that was so heartless and, um, and immoral. I think she, she did have everything. She had station, she had the protection of family, but all that came at a price. And even the, and she had religion, which she found herself, and she found herself losing so much because of her conviction. And um, when she decides to go, it is because she, like Garrison, believes that there must be a way to live more truthfully. And for, for Grimke, I think she sees so much of the hypocrisy of slavery from where she is. And her brother, for instance, who fathers children with enslaved women, um, and his disregard for his offspring, for her nieces and nephews, as it were, um, when she sees that callous disregard for family and for womanhood and the distance between the rhetoric of slavery and the actual practice of it, um, her own conviction, that sense of inner light, again, coming back to that Quaker sensibility, she wants to live a better way and is moved to do that. And when she, when she launches herself, I mean, she goes with her sister. I mean, it's such a Ruth and Naomi kind of moment, you know? And Sarah Grimke says to her, whither thou goest, I will go to. And, and it's a genuine sisterly affection, but they're fearless women. And the, their arrival on the abolitionist scene really changes the dynamic of the way in which just the larger abolitionist institution or enterprise, and also the leaders, the patriarchs of the movement, are going to move forward. Because now you have a woman who has, like Garrison, like Lundy, has seen slavery, has witnessed it, and now is being compelled. You know, she's helped along by Mr. Garrison, who, for whom, the private is always public, right? So he gets a letter from Angelina in which she confesses, again, that rapturous conversion. She says, you know, abolition is a cause to die for. And that could be a real romantic sensibility of a young woman who is finding her place in the world and trying to stretch her wings. But that is a, a momentous thing for a young woman to say without the backing of family or finances or even the safety of home. I mean, women did not strike out. White women did not strike out on their own in this way. And Southern white women certainly did not. And here she arrives and Garrison thinks to himself, as he does on other occasions, like with Mariah Stewart, with Susan Paul, he says, here is someone who will advance the cause and who needs to be at the forefront of the movement. So he publishes the letter in The, in the Liberator. And, um, and so Angelina Grimke, is moved to the forefront of the abolitionist movement. She's, um, she's propelled there by Garrison because women are still negotiating their place in the public political sphere at that point. You have Lydia Maria Child who will never say a word publicly and whose writing is changing the tone of you know, advocacy for African Americans, for Native Americans at that time, thinking about women's education. But she is uncomfortable with this idea of presenting, of lecturing. But Angelina Grimke, like Mariah Stewart before her, again, feels compelled. It's a matter of heart and spirit, you know, of true moral uh, conviction. And so she becomes this powerhouse. And again, it's rooted in what she has seen, and what she will not tolerate. And she doesn't judge in the way that, she doesn't in, in, indict her family and discard them and rage against them. She pursues a better truth. And that's even more infuriating to those left behind. But on the other hand, it empowers her more because she is part of a, a Garrisonian movement and of an abolitionist movement that is trying to convert the minds of those who do not yet believe that slavery is wrong. You know, again, it's the kindness of strangers, right? Of friends yet she has yet to meet because the strength of the abolitionist movement comes from its networks, 
The strength of the Underground Railroad is all about its networks. People who have never met other people become instant champions, and they become stalwart friends in that moment for as long as that moment needs to be. There's a kind of fearlessness about Angelina Grimke, even as she also is facing situations that are unheard of. And she's going into a complete unknown. She could be identified as a pariah. She could be identified as an ungrateful daughter and a rebellious woman and somebody who would be outcast. She has no guarantees when she leaves her home and the comfort of that, at least, you know, modified comfort of, of that family circle where she is known and has a place and has resources from which to, to draw. And the idea that she does go out into the wilderness in a, in a way, right? She leaves the comforts of home and goes to a completely unknown place. Again, you know, testifies to the pull towards something better. And in that time between her departure from home, and that moment where she is catapulted into the public political stage by Garrison and the publication of her private letter to him. It's as though she is gaining strength and again perspective. And it is as though it's a, a time of, of um, it, in a way, self-imposed exile, that there is this purposefulness to this seemingly purposeless adventure and others are not sure what to make of her but she's remarkable for the ways in which she is unto herself that she brings a real conviction and a sense of her steadiness and you know is facing great sanctions because this is not just disobedience to mama and papa this is disobedience this is disobedience to the institution to the south to the church to proper society. I mean, she's really challenging all the rules and, and expectations and constraints that make society civilized, according to some, right? Um, and yet she takes the time to separate and define and to absorb what it is in the world that is better. All of the moves that abolitionists made to assert the humanity of people of color, of enslaved people, self-emancipated people, people other than white residents of these United States had implications for social order. And abolition for some was a direct threat to the way in which lives were lived and social codes and class structure existed. And one of the best ways to both scare a population or rile them up is to suggest that there will be radical, unpredictable changes to the ways in which they live their lives. Who will their neighbors be? Who will they have to sit next to at church? Who might their daughters bring home to marry? So that social dimension of abolition, right? The, the, the subtext, the social subtext of abolition, right? What is equality after all? It's the freedom to be places where you not haven't where you haven't been before. It's the um, license to live a life right next to someone who depends on your invisibility or your subservience in order to acquire, preserve their privilege and their way of life. So as abolitionists are on the one hand asserting the humanity of African Americans, challenging those desegreg you know, challenging the segregation practices, challenging the interracial ban on marriage or the ban on interracial marriage. They are going to the heart of the social order of slavery. There is, of course, the Southern reality, which is that it is a very mixed race society on some levels. And we have those moments of, you know, uh, that, you know, like, 
the Crafts record, Ellen and William Craft. Ellen and William Craft escaped to slavery because Ellen, an enslaved woman, is able to pass as a white man. And at one, one might wonder, well, how is that possible? And one traces the genealogy, same for Douglas. You know, just that sense of, of an interracial reality in the South that is either um, denied, set aside, conveniently ignored, just not accounted for by those who have power. So the abolitionists, again, um, you know, there's all, it's almost as though there always is a twofold mission to abolitionist exercises. One is to advance their own beliefs and philosophies because they are indeed asserting that there should be equal rights. They are then going to advocate where they can for those equal rights to be made manifest. A ban on interracial marriage is one of those places. A ban on segregated seating is another of those places. And yet, the other side of that kind of advocacy and that kind of representation of equality is a way of drawing out the South. They are not advocating for abolitionists or abolition just for their own purposes and delights. It's a political movement. Garrison may be a complete pacifist, and he may decide never to cast a vote, but he is an entirely political creature, right? And, and, and so you see the South again rising to say, this cannot be. This is yet another assault on our way of life. And the kind of fictions and facts that then emerge, because the hornet's nest has been poked again, provides evidence to all who are interested in looking that indeed there are practices that are completely um, uh, real and known, but contested and denied. William Lloyd Garrison and Frederick Douglass have this impressive partnership and connection and alliance. And yet, it's a political and abolitionist anti-slavery alliance that is still influenced by matters of feeling and the heart and ego and pride. And so Douglas goes, Douglas, you know, in, in some ways, I think, you know, at, at a point later on, in their lives when Douglas is really striking out and um, heaping scorn on former colleagues of color and, and or not. Um, and Garrison says, stop chiding and harassing all the people who made you who you were, without whom you would not be here. You know, essentially saying, we made you. You have your difference of opinion, but don't harass us. You know, don't be mean-spirited. But in a way, there's this real finite kind of moment of being made, right? So Garrison sees Douglas, sees the power that this man can bring. And the whole dynamic of how that story of slavery and enslavement is told changes when, Gar when Douglas comes to the anti-slavery stage. Because usually the dynamic was that you would have a self-emancipated or fugitive slave who would show the scars, who would be the object that everybody would be able to see, who would make slavery real. And then you would have the reasoned argument about why that body needed to be saved. In Douglas, you now had the body and the intellect, and both were becoming even more polished and refined. And the way to imagine slavery was very different when, Gar when, when, sorry, when Douglas began to really make his place, make a place for himself. So Douglas goes to England. They go, they go to England. Um, and there is this reception. You know, granted it's from the empire, which has itself a legacy of slavery that is really quite staggering and would render us horror struck as Garrison once was. Um, but Douglas comes back a free man. That's key. That's huge. 
And it's complicated. You know, he is a man who has been self-emancipated, who marries the woman, who sewed the clothes that he wore to make his way to freedom, and he's still not free until money changes hands. However, he comes back to these United States as a free man. So the moment, you know, sort of that reverse middle passage, right, that coming back is all about him rethinking the terms of his engagement with the peculiar institution, but also with the institution of the New England Anti-Slavery Society, the American Anti-Slavery Society, the American Colonization Society, all those institutions that are focused on the place for the black body in America. So the challenge then is really about how does Douglas represent himself? And, you know, on the one level, you hate to reduce it to race. On the other, it's a reality. Garrison is representing an institution in America that is racially um, motivated and, um, and racially informed. Douglas comes from that system. So no matter how many stories Garrison hears, no matter how many coffles he sees, no matter how many mothers he can imagine and conjure up, Douglas has had that experience. And so their approach to, their testimony, the way in which they can bear witness to that reality of slavery is very different. On the other hand, the power that they have, the resources that they have are also very different because Garrison is a white man in a white man's America. And he has longevity where Douglas has not. And he has the power, granted he has skepticism about the role of institutions, but he has the power of institution behind him. And Douglas is about to make his way. He is representing the abolitionist cause. He is the darling, if you will, of the abolitionist ladies who say, you know, when Douglas tells that story, our cause goes forth. He's the one who will take us to that next stage of victory. But Douglas is also going to figure out how to do that on his own terms. And there will be that chafing and that sense of evaluation and reevaluation about what place he has and what place he wants to make for himself. All right. Um, So the abolitionist effort that Garrison is involved in sees some major change every decade. The 30s are the age of Nat Turner and all the ramifications. The 40s are the Mexican War. The 50s is the compromise. And there are these moments that are these are, these are moments that, are, that expose the manipulations and the machinations of politicians, of Washington, of government, of Congress, of representatives who are not entirely there to represent all of the people. And these are moments that also highlight the very local struggle that is abolition and the very national mandate that is American policy. So you see in these moments, like the, the, the compromise of 1850 is huge. On the one hand, thoroughly demoralizing because, you know, I mean, you think of Garrison who says, I will not equivocate. I will, he, he will not compromise under any circumstances on any occasion. And people will say, well, let's negotiate. And he says, no. And for now, there to be this, you know, you can almost hear the tectonic plates shifting in the way in which slavery is being moved around the nation. And it's as though they become just these tiny little cogs in this big wheel that just can override all the effort, all the struggle, all the sacrifice, all the, the, the just the lives lived and lost I mean, they can think of the martyrs for the struggle. They can think of those defining moments when, when they themselves had lives on the line. You know, what was that worth? 
What was that for? If there's going to be this wholesale undermining, but not even undermining, it's like this wholesale investment in the institution of nation building that is just completely antithetical to what should be a free and equal United States. So, but, you know, if abolitionism was going, you know, one thing, one lesson that the abolitionist cause could teach anybody who stepped into it's into the movement was that this is not a race that will be won in a moment. This is not a, a road that can be walked with just five steps. And, you know, Garrison, as you know, you have the, the compromise, you have the Fugitive Slave Act, you have, you know, even the approach to the Civil War and then the the hubbub about whether or not there's going to be an Emancipation Proclamation and what will it be and will he abolish slavery or not. And at one point, Garrison says, you know, slowly we creep. We creep ever closer. And so while we can look at that moment as one that would just rock them to their core, we also can see them thinking about it as just yet another mile in the road, and they have to stay true to the cause. And they recognize that there is this institution. And, you know, part of Garrison's even interest in disunion, right, and separation is because he, he's, you know, it's, it's as though he comes to this understanding that, you know, it's, it's as though when you're really an innocent and you think that everybody's playing fair and that what people say is what they really mean. And as, the, as you grow older, you realize that people are hypocritical and two-faced and that there is a world of intrigue well beyond you, over you, behind you. You have no sense of all the deal making and the ways in which you are thoroughly irrelevant to the larger picture. Garrison gets that awareness. And he has these moments of, you know, realization, whether he's in jail and sees that the state will defend those who are doing the practice of slavery, or he sees the ways in which the judges will remind people like Anthony Burns back into slavery and the whole world has to watch while military might escorts one man through Boston, this cradle of liberty. But that moment of compromise in 1850 is again a moment that reveals, it reveals the extent to which slavery has compromised the core of the nation. So it becomes possible to move through it when one realizes that it exposes the ugly truths and clarifies how, how much more there is to do, but where one must do it. So they have to survive that moment. They cannot fold because whatever suffering they are going through pales in comparison, pales in comparison to those for whom they are, are fighting. And so it's that kind of humble consciousness that enables them to withstand. Yeah, it's heartbreaking, totally you know, demoralizing, but they have to get through it because it's not personal. This is not against them, right? It's, it's against this larger plank, this platform for freedom, right? Slavery comes into Boston in a, in a way that's um, intense and non-negotiable when slave catchers come to town. And part of the wickedness of slavery you know, and part of what Garrison hated was that there was Northern complicity and that there was no free North. It was just one nation thoroughly compromised. And so, you know, part of the, um, these moments with Sims, with Burns, um, are poignant and heartbreaking and thoroughly um, illuminating because when Anthony Burns is, when news of his capture gets, you know, is, when news of his capture goes out, of course, you know, men like Lewis Hayden and the vigilance committees are plotting 
they're going to see what they can do to interfere and to rescue the captive. They've been successful once. Can they be again? But now the state, the system is forewarned. So there are just legions of marshals and officers. And you see a city that Garrison calls home that is referred to as the cradle of liberty transformed into a police state. And in some ways it's thoroughly, you know, just the scale, the magnitude of the federal response to one man, to one man, is really quite, again, it's just, you know, it, it's illuminating because one can argue that, the, that there is a federal investment in the perpetuation of slavery. And others can say, oh, no, no. But then you have evidence of how much is invested in the perpetuation of bondage, made manifest through the figure of someone like Anthony Burns. And when he is marched through the streets of Boston, back down to the harbor, you know, there are thousands in the streets, thousands. And they're on the ships, you know, they're on boats in the harbor. They're hanging out of windows and doorways. And it's as much to see him as it is to register the lengths to which the government will go to accommodate slavery and slavery's claims. When he is transported, when that ship takes him south, the whole t city goes into mourning or at least, you know, the anti-slavery quarters do. But shops close. It's like a national day of mourning in Boston. And that kind of performed grief, that registered the black armbands and the, the bunting, the black bunting hanging and shops closing and people in, in just despair, again, is a, is a, is a way to rally it's not to be opportunistic, but out of their grief, out of this day of loss, they're able to then say, we are now newly resolved because see what we're up against. But, you know, depending on how they read the Bible, they can conjure up the David versus Goliath story and take heart, right? It doesn't have to be uh, that they are indeed powerless. You know, they will be able to make a difference. But it also, I think, underscores the validity of moral suasion, right? Because there's going to be no way that abolitionists, that Brahmins, that well-to-do Boston ladies and their husbands are going to be able to bear arms enough to face down the militias and the marshals who show up for one man. How would they fight it? How would they fight that force? They have to do it by other means. So moral suasion becomes even more necessary and more powerful and more accessible for people who see such wrong being perpetrated in plain sight. Moments like the reminding of Anthony Burns make slavery non-negotiable. You, you cannot imagine it away. Um, and you know, one of the differences, say for instance, between the British abolitionist movement and the American abolitionist movement is that slavery for the average person in England at that time was away. It did not reside within those borders. It never really came home to England. It was, of course, the province of, you know, it was about empire. It was those other places. And, you know, the 1850s just keep eroding and, you know, in eroding that line between um, what's well, not you, I mean, because you can never call it a free North, but slavery just keeps insisting on more ground. So over the course of the 1850s, slavery keeps pushing further and further into the North. Um, it becomes something that has to be accommodated. Um, people become complicit, whether they like it or not. And the stakes are going, the stakes are, are higher and higher. You know, the, the, the punishment for not complying are really quite frightening. And 
So everybody is always already involved. And as you see slavery making its way north in that way, now Northerners have to contend with the loss of their way of life and their perspective on what it means to be in America. And in a way you also have, with the scale and specter of an Anthony Burns moment, you have people in, for instance, the African American community, the Lewis Haydens and the Robert Morrises, who no longer have to say, believe us, here it is, here it is. So, um, you know, for Garrison, the work of abolition was about trying to make people come to a moment of conscience and act accordingly, that they wanted conversion. He wanted conversion. But to be converted from one state to another, one has to see, you know, in this case, one has to see the devil in order to then turn towards God. One has to see evil in order to be committed to a life of good. Slavery marches right up into Massachusetts and people get to see the face of evil. And, you know, in a way, it could be that abolitionists have drawn out that monster. On the other hand, it could be that the federal government, by virtue of its accommodation, has given this license that has not necessar will not necessarily yield a good result because slavery was easier in some ways to ignore when it was not present and visible, when it wasn't compromising people. You know, if you even assist a fugitive, you could be punished, imprisoned, and fined. And we know that there was just callous disregard for whether people were free or enslaved or not. You know, if you just, you know, papers were changed and judges were swayed and, you know, just, there, it was so unpredictable. And that kind of, you know, trespass made it imperative. I think that's the watershed. It became personal for a lot more people. It became non-negotiable for a lot more people. And there had to be a response. They had to defend themselves from slavery now in a way that they never had to before. Well, over the course of Garrison's abolitionist career, there are moments, I think, where he realizes that both the movement and specific individuals will become autonomous. And there are moments of challenge. The split in the American Anti-Slavery Society is one. The, the rift with Douglas is another. And the turn toward violence that's made manifest in the Nat Turner revolt of the 1830s and then the Harper's Ferry moment of the 1850s. And you know, I think part of the reason that Garrison succeeds, not so much even succeeds, one of the reasons that Garrison survives the antebellum period, which is just an overwhelming period to, to confront. I mean, in the ways that he confronts it with all his lists and his documents and his catalogs of evils and the spirited editorials and the responses to, to criticism and the threats on his life. But one of the reasons that he survives is because he has no, no investment in being at the head of the movement. He wants to be in the movement. He wants there to be a movement. And it's that kind of political humility. We might call it savvy, but I think it's more humility that enables him to survive. But at the same time, you know, that moment of Harper's Ferry. And again, John Brown's somebody who has infiltrated, you know, just the bastions of New England, you know, propriety, right? The Concord 12 and, you know, just, you know, who are these people who have funded him and intrigue abounds and, you know, it's, are you on the list? Are you not on the list? And, you know, so the anti-slavery fight literally has come home to Boston, but he's seen that already. 
you know, the Burns moment. But, at, you know, at that moment when John Brown is executed, and at that moment where there is a service and, they, and, and Garrison is, you know, sort of trying to make sense of this moment, two things are, at least, well, many things are happening, but two in particular. One is, in a way that Nat Turner could never be, John Brown becomes a martyr. He has died for this cause. He has died for his beliefs. Garrison could have died many times, but not because he picked up a gun and went to raid a federal arsenal, but because somebody chased him down and lynched him. That would be how he died. He would be a victim. He would, be, he would not be catapulted necessarily to that position of martyr that would rally so many people. And the idea of him, you know, his wife tending to him in the cell until his last moments of the campaigns of the ladies and where will his body be carried and, you know, just all the drama around what it was that John Brown decided to do and how he did it. And whether or not he succeeded or failed, it was the fact that he gave his life and you see that there's this real shift towards, I mean, it's almost immediate. It's like the, the Messiah has been here. You know, they have this memorial service and they say, this is the day on which John Brown was murdered, was killed, the day he died. We gather here now to witness his resurrection. They're talking as though this is the good Lord come back. You know, after three days, this is messianic. And Garrison has to resolve this this, this tension between clearly unapologetic armed resistance and strategy and maneuver with pacifism and moral suasion. And you can see, or we can hear in that speech that he gives, he just, he is truly like a boat in rough sea. He's just rocking back and forth. Yes, we must embrace, but Oh, on the other hand, can we really bear arms? Oh, but John Brown has done so much for them. Oh, but no, he, and you see him va almost vacillating. It's as though he's so torn because he understands what it is to pledge your life to a cause. He did that, has done that. He has been threatened, but he still lives. John Brown marched to the gallows. And Garrison now has to think about what does it mean to be an abolitionist in an age when men can martyr themselves for the cause. It's a very different kind of presence and effect, you know, both on the anti-slavery and the pro-slavery forces. So the role that Garrison plays in the road to the Civil War is a multifaceted one. On the one hand, it seems, when we think about the impact that Garrison has on the peculiar institution of slavery and the national commitment and accommodation of slavery, one can see that the way in which Garrison waged his war with words it wouldn't be fair to say that the abolitionists caused the civil war although there were some who would say that their meddling and their um, mischief upset this notion of unity that was working just fine um, but one of the, I think perhaps the hallmark of the abolitionist movement was its investment in the word. Garrison was committed to telling truths, and he was a brave man at, who told the truth as he saw it. He invited dissent. He said, if you disagree with me, disagree with me, and I will respond. So it wasn't a one-way street. And the, the move towards war, towards a civil war towards secession had everything to do with words as well. So in a way, the abolitionists and all the individuals who were 
articulate and persuasive and uncompromising in their indictment of it and their critique of it and their suggestions for a better union. You know, Sarah Parker Ramond, Charles Lennox Ramon, Douglas Garrison. All of those individuals in, in many ways were fighting the Civil War. They were Civil War soldiers, right? The move towards secession and the Northern move to preserve the Union came about, you know, in a, in a way unwillingly. It was, but it came about in a way, you know, this whole notion of disunion that Garrison was interested in thinking about and pursuing, you know, it wasn't that he was, it was being um, impatient. It was that, again, abolition, you know, was really about exposing the reality, right? It was about laying bare the messy business that kept this big engine going. And, you know, people can think that slavery was just, you know, sort of this modest enterprise and there were many institutions, you know, many homes in the South that did not have slaves and so on. But the big picture is that slavery was the engine that fueled, you know, it was the fuel that powered the engine of these United States. It was slave labor. It was this, you know, sort of class structure, power, privilege, the whole, the whole set of those things. But, um, but, you know, you see Lincoln coming in to office and even as he's campaigning, I mean, he is endorsing Zachary Taylor at one point for president, who is a pro-slavery, slaveholding man, not the first slaveholding president that we have. Um, you know, Lincoln is married to a woman from Kentucky who is part, uh, you know, like Angelina Grimke, established in a profitable, well-to-do slave family. So, um, you know, so, I guess what I wanted to say was, you know, sort of in thinking about the run up to the Civil War and the role or the impact that abolition had on it, you know, you have Garrison thinking about how to tell the truth and to, um, to use the word printed and spoken um, to bear witness to what the peculiar institution is all about and how it is preserved. Right? It's not about the preservation of the Union. He's interested in thinking about how is it that slavery is preserved. And with the, the changes in political climate that you have, as you have Abraham Lincoln coming into office with a record of supporting pro-slavery policies and you know, with his own direct connection through marriage to a, a slave-owning family in Kentucky because of his wife's um, belonging to a family of slave owners, you have Garrison right, and others rightly skeptical that there will indeed be a moment of, of truth and that there will be finally some change in direction in federal policy. But you know, it's as though the, the, um, it's as though that the, the strategy of this war of words is transposed into this war with guns because when South Carolina initiates its secession, it's because it wants to step back. It's feeling maligned. The truths that are being um, shared in the North are offending its sensibilities, and it wants to tell a different story. And so it wants to chart a new history. It's about preserving, yes, slavery, but preserving their own narrative of existence. And Garrison and the abolitionists, all of them, have been involved in campaigns to, again, tell the story. So yes, there's just the loss of the Civil War that was just staggering and the lives lost and the carnage and the, just, just the upheaval and the devastation, all of that there. And it was about states trying to rewrite their own histories and a nation trying to write a new chapter so that you have Lincoln now saying, we must preserve the union. How do we do that? It is through compromise. I mean, at one point he's advocating colonization, 
Right. I mean, there are all the subtexts that don't really get talked about as much, you know, so thinking about, oh, well, what's the cause of this distress? Well, it's the colored people among us. And that famous meeting he has where he brings five ministers of color to the White House and says, you know, basically, you need to leave because your presence here is upsetting everybody. And, you know, as a people, you cannot expect to achieve much here because your presence is just so awful. And can I interest you in colonization? And two of them begin to pursue pursue that line. Um, but overall, Garrison reacts to that with complete horror and says that was one of the lowest moments that I have ever had, you know, the misfortune to behold. And thinks of Lincoln as a tall man with a very small mind. You know, he just is so outraged that the story can just be edited out and, and changed in that way. So for him, the war is, is about the narrative. Well, we know that, you know, history is written by the winners. And at this point, Garrison and the abolitionists want to win. Lincoln and the Union want to win. And the Southern force wants to win. So it's going to become a war, really, of words. Who gets to tell the story that prevails? The move towards secession is as much a, you know, sort of a strategy to maintain autonomy over slavery as it is a protest of how the reputation and the story of Southern life is being portrayed. And we know that this becomes not just a war of words now, it will transform itself into a war with guns. But those two pieces are essentially the same because you have forces now that want to control how the story of America and how the story of this antebellum world is told.